Good evening, everybody. My name is Doug Schantz, and I'm happy to welcome you, you here to St. Vladimir's. Uh, they have kindly made this lovely facility available to us, and I think it's an appropriate venue, uh, given the, uh, the, the topic that we have before us this evening. Uh, it is a pleasure for me to, uh, uh, to count this the fourth of our roster of four lectures. Uh, each year, is, I think most of you are, are old hat to Christian Thought Lectures in Calgary. We have four events a year, two in the fall and two in the winter. Uh, this is the 14th year in which I have uh, had the pleasure of serving as the chair in the chair of Christian Thought at the University of Calgary. Um, it is a pleasure this evening to also uh, welcome Heather Coleman. Uh, when I first uh, came to UFC in 1999, uh, the chair of the department was is sitting in our back row, Ron Neufeld, uh, was chairing. He kind of got me oriented. And Heather Coleman was in the history department, and you you came in... I, I came the year before. Just the year before, mm -hmm. right. And uh, so I want to introduce Heather, and then we'll give her almost an hour uh, to speak. And then I'll invite you to come to this mic here and to offer your response and your questions. And then we're going to have some coffee. And uh, if you're not on the mailing list, and uh, there is a chance for you to sign a yellow sheet over there, and then you'll hear about these events on a regular basis and won't have to depend on the Calgary Herald. The Calgary Herald keeps squeezing the religion coverage. Have you noticed that? Um, I, I, Mario Tanaguzzi actually told me uh, about two months ago that their coverage, he had been cut in terms of his religion coverage. So it's not just an impression you have, it's reality. Uh, they are cutting their religion coverage, they're using wire services and so on, I guess instead. So that's the way this evening will unfold. Um, so let me introduce our speaker. Uh, Heather Coleman uh, grew up in Ottawa. She has her, well, at least in part in Ottawa. Uh, <laughs> she's a world traveler. Uh, she has a BA and MA from Queen's University in history and her PhD at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, I'm using some of her own website here, so I assume it's accurate. <laughs> uh, she says that her first book made use of archival material to examine the Baptists, Russian Baptists, uh, who between 1905 and 1929 were the fastest growing non-Orthodox group in Russia. Uh, and she makes the comment, relevant to our talk tonight, that this is when Russians enjoyed greater religious freedom than any time before 1991. Uh, her current research is centered on a book project, Holy Kiev, Priests, Communities, and Nationality in Imperial Russia from 1800 to 1917. She teaches courses in Russian history from, 19, from 900 to the present, uh, and also a course in religion in modern Europe, which you taught at the University of Calgary, yes, <laughs> because when Heather left, then, then I taught <laughs> Took that it over, course yeah. <laughs> in religion in modern Europe. So Heather, it's a pleasure to welcome you. Um, I, I trust that you have seen the, uh, the promotional material. I note that she has published two books and has uh, a couple of more, couple more on the way, as well as many articles. So please welcome Heather Coleman. Thanks, Doug, for the kind w welcome. And uh, if you sign up for the uh, Chair of Christian Thought wait reading uh, announcements list, you never get off it. I live in Edmonton, and I get it regularly. And I, <laughs> I, ho I always think, oh, I wish I could just come down for the talk. But <laughs> so anyway, it's a pleasure to uh, meet you this evening. And thank you for coming. Um, those of us in the universe, can I just ask, can you hear me all right? It's hard to tell when you're at the front. Yeah, the mic is attached to me. Um, it's okay. Is it okay? Or I can talk at this one. Okay. Um, so those of us in the university setting have just uh, come through uh, our reading week when we catch up on, uh, as the Anglican prayer book would say, those things which we ought to have done. And so I uh, was sitting down to prepare this lecture and, uh, on February 21st, and my 
email inbox was full of news about the first anniversary of that controversial Pussy Riot event uh, that happened in Moscow in February of 2012. Many of you will no doubt recall uh, that on that day, members of a Russian feminist punk band staged a guerrilla performance on the Soleus uh, before the altar at the Cathedral of Christ the Savior in Moscow. And dressed in brightly colored uh, balaclavas, these women danced and sang uh, a, a song, Mother of God, Chase Putin Out, and crossed themselves until they were apprehended by security guards and removed. <laughs> the whole episode lasted less than a minute, uh, but uh, resulted in, the th in three members of the band being arrested, uh, a sensational trial over the summer last summer for, quote, hooliganism motivated by religious hatred, and then a harsh sentence of two years in prison for two of the uh, three people. Uh, well, actually for three of them, and then one has been released. Many foreign celebrities, from uh, our own Brian Adams to Madonna to Aung San Suu Kyi, spoke out against the treatment of the band members, and Amnesty International declared them to be prisoners of conscience. By contrast, the Russian public's reaction was rather muted and on the whole either supportive of the trial or indifferent of it, indifferent to it. Um, now, many people of faith uh, looking on from abroad were shocked by what certainly was a, a sacrilegious outburst, um, but they were equally shocked by the harshness of the sentence. Indeed, this case once again raised the issue that since the mid-19th century has been a particular focus of foreign attention to Russia, the question of freedom of conscience and the relationship between the state and the Russian Orthodox Church. From the 1870s, observers abroad protested the Imperial Russian government's treatment of a range of non-Orthodox religious groups whether they were Jews or Ukrainian uh, Catholics or Baptists or Duchobors. And as we know, Canada and the United States in particular became havens for dissenters fleeing intolerance in the Russian Empire. So for me as a scholar of, of religion in Russia with a long-standing interest in religious dissent, uh, as Doug was saying, my first book was on uh, evangelicals, Baptists in Imperial Russia and the USSR. Um, particularly interesting, worthy of attention, was the extraordinary closing statement at the trial by band member Yekaterina Samutsevich. And with your indulgence, I'd like to read a, a fairly lengthy excerpt, uh, and you have it in your handouts, um, because I know it's hard to follow along. Um, what it shows is that however misguided <laughs> The, in execution, um, Samutsevich justifies her actions as a criticism of the relationship of the Russian Orthodox Church to the state, to secular power, and she sh presents herself as a defender of a truer orthodoxy. Um, so she said, that Christ the Savior Cathedral had become a significant symbol in the political strategy of the authorities was clear to many thinking people. When Vladimir Putin's former KGB colleague, Kirill Gundyaev, took over as leader of the Russian Orthodox Church. After this happened, Christ the Savior Cathedral began to be openly used as a flashy backdrop for the politics of the security forces, which are the main source of power in Russia. Why did Putin feel the need to exploit the orthodox religion and its aesthetic, which are historically associated with the heyday of imperial Russia, where power came not from earthly manifestations, such as democratic elections and civil society, but from God himself? How did Putin succeed in this? After all, we still have a secular state, and any intersection of the religious and political spheres should be dealt with severely by our vigilant and critically minded society, right? Here, apparently, the authorities took advantage of a certain deficit of the orthodox ascetic in Soviet times, when the orthodox religion had an aura of lost history, of something that had been crushed and damaged by the Soviet totalitarian regime, and was thus an opposition culture. The authorities decided to appropriate 
this historical effect of loss and present a new political project to restore Russia's lost spiritual values, a project that has little to do with a genuine concern for the preservation of Russian Orthodoxy's history and culture. In our performance, we dared, without the patriarch's blessing, to unite the visual imagery of Orthodox culture with that of protest culture, thus suggesting that Orthodox culture belongs not only to the Russian Orthodox Church, the patriarch and Putin, but that it could also ally itself with civic rebellion and the spirit of protest in Russia. And so today, like Yekaterina Samutsevich, I, I'd like to think about the evolution of religious politics in Russia in the last couple of decades since the collapse of the Soviet Union and about the fate of religious freedom in Russia today. Why should we in Canada be interested in this trial or interested in the state of religious freedom in Russia? Well, um, as longtime observer of uh, R Russian religious affairs, Geraldine Fagan writes, ultimately as a gauge of how far the citizen is subordinate to government or government subordinate to the citizen, religious freedom points to Russia's future direction as a society. And it seemed to me that the Pussy Riot uh, incident brought together many critical themes in the history of freedom of conscience in Russia and uh, questions about the place of orthodoxy in the Russian state, especially the complex relationship between democratization and, um, and religious freedom. So as we unpack the Pussy Riot incident, we need to think about the legacy of the communist experience the nature of the religious revival that accompanied the collapse of communism, the evolution of religious policy since 1991, but also look a little deeper into the past to think about the roots of that policy in Russia's complex history of managing a multinational and religiously diverse population. The Russian state has faced a long-term dilemma about whether Russia needs a, a, a sort of a unitary national identity or some sort of pluralistic national identity. Um, it's also tended to fear religious conversion, that is to say change, for its p potential to upset a very delicately balanced apple cart. Um, so that's what I want to talk about today. I, can I just check, uh, is, it seems to echo a lot, can you? Yeah, I, and I can't see this side, so I'm just going to. Is that better, or is it still picking it up? It's better? Okay. Yeah, I just feel like I'm... <laughs> but it's always hard to tell. Okay, so in the 1870s and 1880s, the Evangelical Alliance, which was one of the first international ecumen ecumenical organizations um, founded in, in, in Europe in the 1850s, I think, appealed numerous times to the Russian Tsar in defense of converts to Protestantism in that country who were being harassed by police and imprisoned for practicing their faith. In 1888, uh, Konstantin Pobyedinostsev, uh, who was the chief procurator of the Holy Synod, um, this was a, the, basically a, the committee of bishops that ran the Orthodox Church, and he was a, a the arch-conservative advisor of Alexander III, his tutor and his advisor, who was sort of like the minister of the church. He was the, a layman, but the chairman of the, of the synod. And he sent a, a, a public letter of reply to the Evangelical Alliance, and he wrote, you ask for all sects and equal and full liberty. Russia is convinced that nowhere in Europe do heterodox faiths and even those which are not Christian enjoy so full a liberty as in the bosom of the Russian people. But Europe does not know this. And why? Only because among you, religious liberty comprises an absolute right to unlimited propagandism. And so you exclaim against our laws, against those who pervert the faithful from orthodoxy. Now, when Pobyedinosov said that nowhere in Europe did a range of faiths enjoy such liberty as in Russia, he was actually not entirely wrong. Um, indeed, on one level, 
uh, Russia had a long history of religious tolerance. It was connected to its imperial expansion, which began in the 16th century when uh, Muscovy, R Russia's sort of predecessor, incorporated um, highly organized Muslim communities in the Volga region. Um, and as various peoples, other peoples were uh, incorporated into the empire, became subjects of the Russian Tsars, they generally, generally received formal permission to practice their faith, the faith of their ancestors, whether it was Buddhism or Islam or Lutheranism or Judaism, Roman Catholicism, Mennonites, uh, Armenian Gregorian Christianity. And so by the late 19th century, when Pobyedonosov was writing, roughly 30% of, uh, of Russian subjects belong to so-called foreign confessions uh, with the right to practice those. Not long after Pobyedonosov wrote, uh, a French expert on Russia who was no particular fan of the Russian government, I might add, um, wrote that Nevsky Prospect, the, the grand avenue that runs through the imperial capital of St. Petersburg still today, had so many churches of so many denominations on it that it really could be called Tolerance Street. So um, yes, certainly on one level, the Russian Empire uh, had a system of multiple established faiths. Um, their activities were regulated and supervised by the Ministry of the Interior in, in a special department called the Department of Foreign Faiths or Foreign Confessions. But you have to note that it was a department for foreign confessions because Imperial Russia was also a, an Orthodox Christian state. Um, since the mass uh, conversion of the Eastern Slavs uh, to the faith of the Greek Byzantine Empire in the late 10th century by the Grand Prince of Kiev, Vladimir, whose <laughs> church we're in today, um, Eastern Orthodox Christianity had been intimately bound up with the Russian state and Russian identity. It was the religion of virtually all ethnic Russians. It was the re religion of Russia's rulers. And in the words of the fundamental laws of the Russian Empire, uh, it was the predominant religion of the state. In the 1830s, reacting to the emerging challenges of, of constitutional politics, of socioeconomic change, the emergence of modern uh, society and ideas, uh, this, the Russian state enunciated a re reactionary official ideology based on three interlinked principles, orthodoxy, autocracy, and nationality. And this triad that was known as official nationality linked faith, authority, and Russian national identity in one potent phrase. And so Imperial Russia was, as, as Paul Wirth puts it in his groundbreaking forthcoming <laughs> uh, book on religious governance in the Russian Empire, uh, really a multi-confessional orthodox state, um, a place that had several established faiths, but one of them was dominant. And this takes us to the second part of Pobyedonosov's retort to the Evangelical Alliance, and that was his assertion that uh, there were different principles of religious liberty at play in Russia and in Western Europe. Because a key um, principle of mul the multi-confessional Orthodox state was that only the Orthodox Church had the right to make converts. In fact, uh, just a few years earlier, as ethnic Russians and Ukrainians, uh, whom the government considered Russians too at the time, but we can't get into that <laughs> story, <laughs> um, began to, when these people began to convert to evangelical Christianity under the influence of German-speaking uh, Mennonite and Pietist subjects of the Russian Tsar, Pobyedonosov um, had declared that there are and can be no Russian Baptists, period. Uh, in 1874, uh, the Russian state had in fact established a legal Baptist church, but it was only for converts from Lutheranism. You had to be a German to be a Baptist. You couldn't be a Russian Baptist. 
Um, and so the church and state worked tirelessly to prevent Orthodox Christians from leaving the state church and becoming evangelical Christians, refused to sanction their meetings, arrested them, imprisoned them, and so on. The same problem applied uh, to Ukrainian and Belarusian populations in the western parts of the empire that had once belonged to the Uniate uh, Greek Catholic Church. Um, but after Polish territories were absorbed into the Russian Empire in the late, uh, where they lived in the late uh, 18th century, they, they had been forcibly reunited to the Orthodox Church uh, in 1839 and then again in a big wave in 1875. This is because they were ethnic Russians and therefore they were Orthodox and therefore that's where they were going to be assigned. So each group had its box, and you stayed in your box. Um, and so Pobiedonosov contrasted the Evangelical Alliance's assertion of religious liberty as an absolute right to unlimited propagandism, as he said, a view that emphasized an indivi the individual nature of faith with the more static, traditional, communal conception of religious toleration that applied in the Russian Empire. Now, the notion of freedom of conscience, uh, with its emphasis on the individual and his or her rights, was in fact very much in the air in autocratic Russia in this period. Um, it's a, it was a major theme of late imperial Russian uh, thought, uh, liberal, socialist, but also um, writers in the theological academies, the Orthodox theological academies of the empire were very interested in this question of freedom of conscience in, in, the, in the last years of the empire. And uh, amid the general cry for rights and dignity from the population, freedom of conscience emerged as a crucial issue during the revolution of 1905 that resulted in the declaration of a semi-constitutional regime in Russia, um, is something that lasted um, and, uh, till the end of the empire. And uh, the 1905 revolution also resulted in the downfall of Pobyedonostsev, whom I've been talking about. But the legacy of the revolution was a, a, an unresolved tension between individual and communal uh, religious rights. The government of Nicholas II at last extended toleration to members of the Orthodox Church who wished to convert to other Christian faiths. But at the same time, his government in 1905 promised freedom of conscience, but preserved the Orthodox Church's monopoly on gaining converts, on proselytizing. And so after 1905, you got this very funny situation. Thousands of people left the Orthodox Church, especially uh, these Ukrainian and Belarusian <laughs> Catholics who had been forced to become Orthodox, also uh, these evangelical uh, Ukrainians and, uh, and Russians, Baptists. But then you get this complex dance that developed over, um, you know, as these Slavic Baptists, for example, organized legal communities, built prayer houses, founded periodicals, and basically proceeded to behave as though they were free, uh, the state uh, is still trying to um, control propaganda and what, what is the line <laughs> between living out your faith and, and um, sort of uh, stealing believers from the Orthodox Church. Um, the state, uh, and, and as they do this, they in fact are pushing on the limits of civil society in Russia. They're opening up new space in that society. They're a crucial part of the democratization process that was going on in the years before the revolution. It's just ordinary people of faith who are getting on with their life and who didn't think they were interested in politics but suddenly find <laughs> that they need to be. The state after 1905 was still used to relating to the population through the intermediary of religious groups. Um, treating religion as a legal collective status rather than an individual choice. So, for example, the civil reg there was no civil registry. And so it was very complicated if people leave orthodoxy, you know, where do we register your births, deaths, and, and so on. Everybody still needs to fit into a box somewhere. And these tensions were unresolved at the time of the revolution. <clears throat> 
The victory of the Bolshevik party in November of 1917, as you know, inaugurated uh, the longest sustained state anti-religious policy in a campaign in history. As Marxists, the Soviet communists viewed religion as uh, the product of a socioeconomic system of feudal or capitalist exploitation. They thought it was doomed to wither away as socialism built a non-exploitative classless society. Uh, in January of 1918, right after coming to power, the Bolsheviks uh, issued a decree on the separation of church and state, which expropriated all church, uh, well, all religious lands uh, and property without compensation, stripped religious organization of their status as legal entities, uh, which meant they then couldn't buy property or sign leases or uh, do a whole lot of things and banned religious instruction in public settings. Later in the summer, the Constitution of 1918 formally provided for religious freedom and established the right to conduct religious and atheist propaganda. Um, but religion didn't die, um, even though its economic base had been pulled out from underneath it. Um, and the state was not neutral to religion because the communist goal was to achieve a society uh, that was not merely secular but enthusiastically atheist. Um, so they soon realized that more concerted efforts were going to be required to replace the worship of God with devotion to the socialist state and its ideals. So in the, from the first years of Soviet power, uh, state campaigns tried to destroy the organizational vitality of uh, religious groups, uh, and as well as the social and moral significance of, of faith itself. And the 1920s and 30s are this great, are the site of a, of a great battle for the dominance of the state and its ideals over Russian society. Uh, suffice it to say that the 1918 Constitution's uh, awarding of the right to conduct religious propaganda in practice uh, was very quickly severely curtailed. And in 1929, uh, the law was amended to permit citizens only to conduct religious worship and atheist propaganda. And in reality, worship became increasingly difficult. Uh, in Moscow, the city, for example, uh, there were 600 religious communities in 1917, and only 20 of them were still open in 1939. So it's a complete collapse of, of uh, public religious life by the eve of the Second World War. Churches, synagogues, mosques were used as museums, warehouses, skating rinks, recording studios, drill halls. Uh, when I first went to the Soviet Union in the late 1980s, I saw them used for all of those things. <laughs> um, by the 1960s in the Soviet Union, the, the form of repression for the most part changed from outright persecution to a sort of grudging show of so-called tolerance. Uh, in exchange for accepting high levels of state interference, certain religion, religious organizations were allowed to remain open basically as showpieces for what socialism, you know, socialism's openness and so on. The clergy were tightly controlled and bishops and other religious leaders uh, were appointed uh, only in consultation with the state. This meant that all religious groups were split internally um, into those who were willing to go along with the authorities in exchange for preserving some sort of public presence and those who refused and therefore were pushed underground. Um, um, and being a believer brought serious um, civil disabilities. Uh, if you wanted to get ahead, you, you, you professed atheism and you stayed away from services. You kept your religious beliefs to yourself. Um, I have a, a good friend here in Calgary who, uh, whose mom was, uh, uh, defending her PhD thesis in the early 1970s in Soviet Ukraine, and um, she very much wanted her daughter baptized, but if it was found out that she was having her daughter baptized, she was not not gonna get her PhD, and she wasn't gonna be able to have a job, and, uh, and so she uh, was actually not present at her daughter's baptism. She, uh, a neighbor, volunteered to take her out to a village and have her baptized in the village. Um, 
because she was too scared to, to have it known. Um, and, and people developed uh, ways of, people still visited cemeteries on, at Easter. There was massive numbers of people visited cemeteries at Easter. They didn't go to churches at Easter, but they went to cemeteries. So you get these sort of patterns of substitutions and, and so on. The, the, the sum of this is that by the mid-1980s, these policies seem to have borne fruit. Uh, the Russian population was largely atheist, with uh, over 70% claiming to have no belief in God. And yet by 1991, 22% of these former atheists now said they believed. The percentage of people who said they were believers rose from a quarter to 40% of the population between 1990 and 1992, very quickly. Uh, thousands of people, especially the young, uh, were flocking to the churches for baptism. And I was one of the young at the, you know, I was 20 <laughs> um, in 1988, 89, when I first went to the Soviet Union. And all of my friends were all getting baptized. And there were lines at the church. There was hardly any churches open. And, and there were, there were uh, midday services, there were lines at the churches. People were standing around the doors. People were fascinated. Um, it's, in fact, estimated... Am I beeping? <laughs> okay. It's in fact estimated uh, that in the years between 1986 and 1996, up to 30 million Orthodox baptisms were administered in Russia. Um, uh, the population today is, a, is 142 million. So just to give you a sense, it was a similar population. They don't have very good population growth. So, <laughs> um, then. So the authority of the Orthodox Church, the traditional religion of the Russian people as an institution soared in the late Soviet period and early post-Soviet era. A series of Russia-wide polls in 1993 and 1994 found the church to be consistently rated among highest, uh, absolutely highest, among seven key Russian institutions. The others are the presidency, uh, the government, the army, the secret police, the trade unions, the press. So for example, a November 1994 poll showed that 59% of Russian citizens had confidence in the church. All the other institutions listed, including the judicial system, the state security system, came in at 32% or lower, and dead last, was the parliament, the Duma, at 16% approval rating. So where did this newfound popularity for orthodoxy come from? Well, it came partly, of course, from Gorbachev's uh, famous policies of glasnost in the late 1980s, of openness. Uh, and of course, religious faith had not died out completely. Um, it, in fact, had become an important form of dissidence in the 1960s and the 1970s. In fact, one of the very first of the dissident pressure groups that so interested Westerners in the Brezhnev era was actually an association of prisoners' wives founded by Baptist women whose husbands were jailed for their beliefs in the mid-1960s, for refusing to participate in the, the official Baptist church. By the 1970s, many dissidents, the most famous of them being Alexander Solzhenitsyn, were looking to Russia's orthodox roots for an alternative source of Russian identity, uh, an alternative understanding of Russia's mission in the world. But under Gorbachev, it became increasingly clear that the old restrictions on religious practice were falling away. In 1987, it was announced that all prisoners of conscience in Soviet jails would be released. Uh, the following year, Gorbachev explicitly called for full cooperation with religious believers. And that same year, in 1988, the communist, uh, or I guess it was 89, uh, the communist state and churches collaborated in elaborate celebrations of the millennium of Eastern Slavic Christianity. In 1990, the Russian Federation, which the USSR was a federation and Russia was the largest of the of the member republics, uh, it passed a, uh, a new, very liberal law on freedom of religions, which declared a strict equality of all religions before the law, and the right to propagate religious ideals in oral, printed, or other form. A poll taken in 1991 showed that 66% of Russians favored equal status for all faiths. 
In July of 1991, Yeltsin, Boris Yeltsin took the oath as the first democratically elected president of the Russian Federation. And the patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church, Alexei II, participated in the ceremony and blessed the new president. This is still the communist era. It's the last six months, but it's, it's quite significant. Within six months then, the Soviet Union was gone, and Yeltsin became president of the largest post-Soviet republic, uh, Russia. Religious revivals then seemed to be part of the birth pangs of a new political and legal order in Russia. But very quickly, um, Russia moved from glasnost to soul wars, um, because very soon controversy entered this religious revival. Controversy came from two main sources. Um, first, there's the problem of the past. And secondly, there's the problem of a huge influx of foreign missionaries of various faiths and denominations. As the Soviet Union was collapsing in 1991, pro-democracy Russian parliamentarians briefly got a chance to examine a number of KGB files, including some that shed light on the KGB's frequent and wide-ranging intrusion into the life of the Russian Orthodox Church. Materials show, showed that four of the six permanent members of the Holy Synod, the top leadership of the church, were KGB agents. Uh, and this included Patriarch Alexei himself. Um, an agent is more than an informer. Um, uh, an agent was an active operative. Um, uh, and the patriarch, it showed, had got a reward for his service in 1988, which is awkward as well. Um, and the current patriarch was also on that list, by the way, um, uh, that um, uh, Samutsevich refers to in that speech we started with. It's interesting. Um, Alexei offered a quite a thought-provoking um, self-defense, which does force us to think about what would I have done. Um, in 1990, he said, the church with its many millions of members cannot descend into the catacombs in a totalitarian state. We sinned. But for the sake of the people, the hierarchs of the church took the sin upon their souls, the sin of silence, the sin of non-truth. And we have always done penance before God for this. So that reminds us that these are choices we don't have to make. I just want to make that point because I'm going to say mean things about the church in some points. So not mean things, but critical things. <laughs> um, so these revelations uh, launched a debate about the proper position of the church in society. Remember that this is a period where democracy is being invented <laughs> in Russia by people who've never lived through it. And they're trying to figure out you know, what what is the relationship between the institutions in our society? And what's the relationship between the government and individuals? And religion is at the crux of this. Um, some argued that the church should divest itself of property, should get rid of compromised individuals, sever ties with the state, and focus on internal missionary work. Their opponents, by contrast, advocated a, a church with abundant material possessions, uh, close ties to the state, a big institutional presence was the way to re-Christianize Russia. Um, Alexei tried to sort of steer a, a, a sort of right center course through this debate, but fundamentally, although he and, and the other centrists paid lip service, to the concept of the separation of church and state. In fact, they begin, began to act quite quickly as though the Moscow Patriarchate was the revived Imperial Russian Orthodox State Church. And you can see this especially in their attitude toward the second major challenge of the early post-communist period, the arrival of foreign missionaries. In the early 1990s, the influx of hundreds of uh, mostly American Protestant missionaries, uh, in particular, became a controversial issue. Um, many Russians, not just the church leadership, were quite baffled and bothered by this experience. Churches competing with one another was a weird concept uh, to them. Um, <clears throat> and 
there was a widespread belief that many of these groups were taking advantage of the economic bankruptcy of the Orthodox Church to essentially buy converts by offering free English lessons and food baskets and all kinds of goodies like that. To many, these uh, foreign uh, pr missionaries seem to preach uh, uh, Christ, the market economy, and Western democracy sort of all rolled into one. And uh, there were, in fact, some legitimate anxieties about the attitude toward Russia's Orthodox tradition displayed by some of these missionaries. Uh, many Russians complained that they behaved as though Russia had never known Christianity, as though there was, as though Orthodoxy didn't qualify as Christianity, um, as though they were, quote, a country of pagan savages. Um, so by 1993, uh, you had the uh, Alexei, the, the patriarch, actively warning that a new law was needed to counter the work of these foreign missionaries. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so one approach uh, would have been to focus the Orthodox Church's activities on a broad program of, of evangelization and pastoral outreach to meet the challenge of these foreign groups. But this isn't really how the central church reacted. Um, there was a lot of productive religious activity going on at the grassroots. People, believers were engaged in restoring churches, uh, in, in opening orphanages, in engaging in charitable work. And certainly, you know, sort of from a social science perspective, this was a very important feature of the early post-Soviet period. This is a, th these are the roots of, of civil society. These are people doing things independently and, and, and organizing themselves. But this was not um, particularly the focus of the church leadership. Uh, and to a great extent, the believers were doing this in spite of the leadership rather than uh, as uh, the, the kind of focus of what they were being encouraged to do. Um, the church as a whole took a long time to engage in systematic Christian education, um, a long time to allow much leeway for lay activism. Instead, the bishops per per pursued an active public role, uh, institutional visibility, and influence in public affairs. Um, riding to some extent on, on a genuine and popular search for uh, a new, to reclaim Russian national identity in the wake of the collapse of the Soviet one, the hierarchy focused on restoration of church property and reasserting the orthodox character of Russian cultural and state life. People were very much searching in the early 1990s and, and religion was at the center of that. But there were also elements in the bureaucracy and among politicians who were looking for ways to sort of Resacralize the state to redefine its identity, and, and they were keen to use the, re, the, the imagery of religion to that end. Uh, and so you have numerous showy projects in the 1990s uh, that are designed to sort of stamp orthodoxy on the public face of, of Russia where it had been removed by the anti religious campaigns. And a particularly charged example was the rebuilding of the Christ the Savior Cathedral in Moscow. Now, the original um, Cathedral of Christ the Savior had been built uh, as a big national project in the 19th century, built between the 1830s and 1881 uh, uh, by public subscription and by cooperation between the church and the state to, to honor Russia's victory over Napoleon in 1812. And when it was opened in 1881, it was the biggest church in the empire. It's right downtown in Moscow on the Moscow River next to the Kremlin, beautiful big golden domes. Uh, so it was a great showpiece church and a very much a sort of state-driven church from the get-go. In 1931, under Stalin, it was blown up um, to make way <laughs> to build a 400 plus meter, um, what's the word, a palace of the Soviets, which was going to be this sort of great representation of, 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 of Soviet power. Um, but they ended up having very serious structural problems. The ground wouldn't hold under this building and they eventually gave up. And in the Khrushchev era, in the 1960s, they built the largest outdoor swimming pool in the Soviet Union in that spot. Um, and uh, actually, interestingly enough, it was, it was widely um, 
used for baptisms because the, orth the Orthodox practice full immersion baptism. So people would just go swimming with somebody else and say a few words before dun dunking themselves. Anyway, uh, so for years this space kind of symbolized the failure of the communist dream. Um, you know, that the earth wouldn't hold after the, after the church was destroyed. Um, but after the collapse of communism, uh, intellectual, political, and religious figures mobilized in the early 1990s to rebuild the church. And various public bodies, including the city of Moscow and federal agen agencies, donated large sums to the reconstruction of this, of this church. Um, and this was highly controversial. This is a time when people were very hungry. This is a time when very large numbers of public servants were not receiving their salaries, and somehow money was found to build this, this church. Um, and I remember um, appeals in the metro um, encouraging citizens to make donations, and there wasn't a single mention of faith in those. It was dear, you know, uh, sorry, I can only think of the Russian word suddenly, <laughs> sorry. Um, dear uh, fellow countrymen, you know, send, send your donations for the resurrection of our great national symbol. Um, the Moscow authorities dominated the um, decision-making process, this, claim, this aim to reclaim national honor. And so many people, and not just Pussy Riot, who staged their protest in this church, um, have long felt that it is a symbol of a questionable relationship between the church and the post-Soviet state, rather than a sort of a token of the, city, of the country's renewed spirituality. Meanwhile, in 1993 and again in 1995, the Orthodox Church intensively lobbied President Yeltsin and the Duma to pass legislation that would prohibit the activity of foreign missionaries in, on Russian soil. Its leaders argued that the Russian church was too weak uh, at present to withstand the competition of foreign groups. But more importantly, they looked at questions of evangelism very differently from their competitors. The Russian Orthodox Church treated Russian, sorry, religious affiliation in territorial rather than voluntaristic terms. In other words, it argued that Orthodoxy was the a canonical religion of the Russian soil, that Russian space was orthodox space, and uh, that everyone in it was, was, was theirs, <laughs> that was their territory. Even the more ortho moderate orthodox who were willing to allow foreign groups to operate called on them to help orthodoxy um, uh, rather than um, grow their own denominations. Um, so, but, but the thing was that even with the departure of all those 15 other, 14 other Soviet republics, the Russian Federation remains a multinational country with many different ethnic and religious groups represented. And it's also a place where the majority of Russian citizens, uh, although they identify as Orthodox, don't go to church. Um, even if in the early 1990s, 75% of men and 45% of women declared themselves to be non-religious, the church regarded them as its de facto members because they were Russians. Therefore, you are ours. Um, so Orthodox missions in the 19, early 1990s focused on mass baptism campaigns, showing presence in that canonical territory more than on Christian education. Polls continue to show that the religious revival of that period was wide but not deep. Um, people identify with the church. They're willing to see the church's position ele elevated in Russian life, but only 2% of those identifying as Orthodox actually attend church weekly. 70% of the people who identify as Orthodox have never taken communion, so they've been baptized and then they've never really gone to church. Uh, only 40% of those who identify as Orthodox believe in God. Um, so interestingly, the, the church then is in this, is in this, funny, this funny position. Um, and the church enters the political fray um, uh, with a discourse of itself as a victim of communism 
but also as a, demo, as a defender of democratic values of the new Russia through a very effective campaign against so-called totalitarian sects. Um, so um, during this, and, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so by September of 1997, the church's lobbying efforts had paid off. A new law uh, on freedom of conscience and on religious associations represented a radical departure from the 1990 law on freedom of religions, um, and which had declared the equality of all religious groups, and seemed to contradict the 1993 constitution that declared all religious associations as equal before the law. The preamble of the 1997 law, which is still in effect today, uh, declared all religious, uh, sorry, declared Orthodox Christianity as an inseparable part of the all Russian historical, spiritual, and cultural heritage. And it declared that the state also respected, quote, religions constituting an integral part of the historical heritage of Russia's peoples. And it names Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, and Judaism. So, the law sort of lists the historical, the traditional religions that are, that are sort of the, 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 the special ones. <laughs> and then there's everybody else. The new statute sets up a, set up a two-tiered system. On the one hand, there were religious organizations, and they had full legal rights. But to qualify as a religious organization, you had to show 15 years of legal existence well, in 1997, that meant that you had to show that you had been registered in 1983 under, under the Soviet period, under Andropov. Um, and uh, so that meant that uh, or, that, or that your church had been part of a, a larger centralized organization registered in the Soviet period. But remember, those are the groups that have made deals with the government. And all kinds of other groups existed, but were not registered. Um, so all other groups were not organizations. They were merely religious groups. And they had a large range of restrictions applied to them. Uh, they could not um, be legal entities. So they couldn't purchase property. They couldn't organize uh, educational institutions. They couldn't. Uh, publish and distribute literature. They couldn't invite foreign guests. They had no access to prisons and other institutions, no tax exemptions, no exemptions uh, on, of clergy from military service. Basically, they have the right to worship, to teach their fellow believers, uh, and those, that's, those are their guarantees. Uh, and this law also outlawed independent religious activity by foreign citizens. So yes, you can have a foreign missionary who comes to work if you invite, you a Russian citizen group, invite that person, but they can't just come. So this is a process of reintroducing close state regulation of religious life. Um, there were some echoes of that old multiple establishment of the pre-revolutionary period. Um, now, in fact, um, this law, this law cre created a lot of anxiety when it was first passed. But in fact, um, it's a, to a great extent, it's a case of what Tolstoy called Russia's greatest blessing, which is that Russia has bad laws that are poorly enforced. And um, this law um, uh, has certainly uh, limited the possibilities of uh, certain religious possibilities, but at the same time, it's been very much a kind of a local option sort of arrangement. Um, the, 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 the federal government has not, um, by and large, pushed hard for the implementation of the law, so it has been patchy. It has depended in local contexts how it has been applied. Um, <clears throat> There's a lot of ambiguity. There's a great tradition of getting around laws. Russians, when they see a law kick, they, 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 don't, they assume laws are a problem. Um, <clears throat> and so, um, excuse me. <clears throat> and, so, and so this law has, has had sort of patchy implementation rather than being as draconian as it may look on paper. 
But um, as I mentioned a moment ago, interestingly enough, supporters of this legislation, uh, anchored in the church primarily, used a discourse of democracy and European values to advance their cause. Um, a young American scholar named Emily Baran, who's uh, written some interesting work on the um, Jehovah's Witnesses in Russia since or during the communist period and after, uh, points out that um, the critical figure here was a, a, an orthodox specialist on new religious movements, a fellow named Alexander Dvorkin. Dvorkin's an interesting guy. He, was a, he, he emigrated from the USSR in the 1970s, was educated in the United States, uh, was interested in the furor about cults that emerged in, in North America in the 1970s and 1980s and became very knowledgeable on the subject and then went back to, uh, went back to Russia and became involved in uh, organizing anti-cult uh, organizations in, in Russia using the studies and the rhetoric from the West, the notions of brainwashing, mind control, and so on. But he adapts, adapted them to the challenges of the early 1990s uh, when multiple Western-based religious groups appeared in Russia. Some of these are, are what we consider sort of new religious movements here. You know, the, the, the Hare Krishna were active, the, you know, these kinds of groups. Uh, the Scientologists were out on the streets. Uh, I was asked many times if I'd like to come, um, but, uh, but, but, but they also are, are the Mormons, they also are Pentecostals, they also are Baptists, they also are Lutherans, uh, there's a range of people, and he kind of put them all into the cult category. And his great success was in linking this Western-based language of brainwashing and, uh, and cults with uh, the Russian past by coining this term, totalitarian sects, in 1993, a term that has become standard in Russia for talking about uh, these groups. And this allows them then to frame rank-and-file members of, uh, of foreign-based religious groups as victims uh, it allows the anti-cult movement to argue that restricting totalitarian sex, far from denying citizens' freedom of conscience, actually ensures that right. The Orthodox Church itself, as a victim of Soviet totalitarianism, wants to save others from totalitarianism. Um, that is the nature of the, of the, the argument. Um, and. Uh, and, and, and uh, the other theme is that they are preserving European values. Dvorkin had close, has and had close ties with European anti-cult movements and pointed out that whereas in the United States with its excessive religious freedom, uh, you had tragedies such as Jonestown and so on, European governments like Belgium, France, Austria, Germany had active anti-cult policies and legislation. So they argue, look, we're democracy is not the problem. We're following a European model that's not like those crazy North Americans who don't get it and uh, let totalitarian cults take over. These sects are taking advantage of a weakened state, a weakened church, and we're defending democracy. So the 1997 law is probably the greatest victory of the Orthodox Church. Um, but from the church hierarchy's point of view, um, the challenge was making that preamble about the Orthodox Church's preeminence in Russian history and culture and state life meaningful. And this is one of the key religious stories of the Putin era, of the last 10 to 12, 12 years, say. Um, and and uh, this is where I want to, to turn to finish. Um, as we'll see, the, church's, the church hierarchy's effort to place the Russian Orthodox Church at the center of state policy in Russian life has been actually a mixed success for a variety of reasons. Um, the relative indifference of Putin, despite what Pussy Riot <laughs> said, um, the way in which the notion of European values can actually be played both ways, and most importantly, the practical realities for Putin of managing the ethnically and religiously diverse po Russian population. <laughs>
So Vladimir Putin, the former KGB officer, came to power in 2000 after the surprise resignation of the ailing uh, Boris Yeltsin and uh, quickly made a show of being an orthodox believer. Um, at the same time, he also made a point of visiting Russian synagogues, mosques, other places of worship, and speaking about the multicultural nature of the country. His personal statements on the value of religion in public life tended to emphasize the importance of teaching values, but were, it was actually quite vague about what those values were. Um, Putin famously focused on, in, in, has famously focused on what he calls reestablishing a dictatorship of law and building a vertical of power, which means anti-corruption, uh, making laws actually be, be uh, enforced, and reducing um, regional power and ensuring centralized power to Moscow. The vertical is, means that it's not diffused. So he's reasserting law and order, uh, re-centralizing political authority. And overall, this, this managed democracy, as he calls it, has been accompanied by what Nicholas Gvozdiev, Gvozdiev uh, calls managed pluralism. Um, the church has sought to advance the position of orthodoxy rhetorically um, through the language of canonical territory, for example. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church in the, in the, in the last decade tried to um, change itself organizationally in Russia and establish actual dioceses. It, it had outposts and wanted to establish dioceses, and the Orthodox Church went crazy, complaining to the government, breaking off ties with, with the Vatican, uh, saying, you know, you are impin impinging on our canonical territory by describing dioceses in our, in our country. What's interesting is that the state has not actually been all that supportive of these. This has been quite effective uh, on, on a rhetorical level. It, it's certainly a big sort of theme that you hear in the press and in Russian thought about religion, but the state um, actually has been relatively uh, uninterested in helping on this. Um, the Orthodox Church has also uh, revived the language of symphony uh, this was the Byzantine vision of cooperation between church and state and a sort of a division of, of functions between them. Um, of course, this con conveniently forgets that the pre-revolutionary church enjoyed no such thing and chafed under considerable state control um, in the pre-revolutionary period. Um, and this, too, has not been very well received by the government. An interesting example of the ongoing story of the past decade relating to the introduction, uh, relates to the introduction of faith-based teaching, uh, the subject of, quote, fundamentals of orthodox culture in the public school system. Once again, this is an interesting story where the orthodox church has, in fact, appealed to a broader European pattern, has said, look, Finland, Germany, these democratic countries have religious instruction in state schools by religious specialists, um, by priests and clerics of various sorts. Um, and we, uh, and after communism, we need to introduce this kind of uh, teaching in our public schools. But the problem was that there was a 1992 law on, uh, of, on education on the books which explicitly prohibited any activity by religious organizations in state schools. Um, and this idea that emerged in the late 1990s and especially actively in the early years of Putin in the first years of the 2000s um, didn't get much traction in Moscow because there, there were too many legal problems connected with it. But it developed uh, in local areas, um, in certain regions where the church and the state got along nicely. Uh, 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 this, this course was introduced as a, what is, uh, the Russian word is culturological, which means that it, this is about the culture of orthodoxy. It's not about the teachings, just about the culture. But the problem was that uh, a furor developed as 
other traditional religions of the Russian, uh, of, of the Russian Federation said, well, maybe we could have a chance to teach our cultural tradition in schools, too. Moreover, uh, other groups, traditional, non-traditional, atheist groups, brought legal complaints to the courts, saying they're not teaching just orthodox culture. They're teaching the children that they have immortal souls and that they, they're teaching faith. <laughs> they're teaching doctrine and not just culture. And uh, the church actively, openly called on Putin to back this program, to support the fundamentals course, and Putin refused. Uh, he said the Constitution declares the equality of all religions, and we, this, is, this is too much of a problem. We have too many people who are unhappy. And so there was a standoff for several years in the, in the past decade. Uh, and it's only this year um, that all grade fours began a compulsory religion class. But this is very different from what was originally proposed because they can choose between six options. Uh, there is Russian Orthodox Christianity, um, there is Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, world religions, or secular ethics. And what's very interesting is that the most popular by far has been the basis of secular ethics as the course chosen, uh, followed by the Russian Orthodox tradition and followed by world religions. So um, uh, the, the population has sort of spoken uh, on that. Similarly, uh, we see a backing down over the law proposed last fall after the Pussy Riot trial that would introduce prison terms for offending people's religious feelings. Opponents um, saw that law proposal as part of a broader kind of Kremlin campaign to suppress dissent and to bolster public support by casting Putin as a sort of defender of religious believers. But the definition of offending religious feelings in the law pr proposal is so broad and so vague that it basically risks being either ineffective or applied selectively in practice and and clearly could hurt relations between Russia's various religions. Because if, the, if, if Muslims say that there is no God but Allah, does that automatically hurt the feelings of, because it's all about hurting people's feelings. It's very, very hard to sort of um, decide where the lines go. And so, in fact, um, uh, there, 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 there is now a process of kind of backpedaling going on, and, they, and the, 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 the law pro project is being completely gutted and rewritten as we speak in the Russian Duma committees and, and so on. So we can sort of see that in the Putin era, there's, it's been convenient at various times for him to play the religion card. Um, there has been, for example, incre increased enforcement of the 1997 law in recent years. But the problem with that is that believers use the courts. And uh, believers have been effective in the courts in Russia, but also in taking them, their cases, to the European Court of Human Rights. So the European story can be played both ways, um, to fight back and, and do well. Um, and so we, can, so we have seen that, um, uh, in, as I say, in the last month or so, there's been a, for example, uh, it has come to their attention that um, defending the rights of religious believers to not have their feelings hurt could hurt the feelings of the large atheist element in the society. So they're adding a section on not offending atheists. So, you know, it's become this kind of uh, complicated story. So... International polls in 2009, before this all broke out, interestingly showed relatively high societal support for religious freedom. 61% uh, of the population believed that all faiths should be equal, period. It also showed uh, that only 13% of the population, a lower percentage than in France or Germany, uh, supported the idea of having an anti-defamation law. So there's very little support uh, for, for laws against hurting feelings and these sorts of things. So 
what we see here is that managing this managed democracy also means managing its inherent pluralism. The facade of orthodoxy is useful when it's useful. But there's a general um, worrying, certainly, uh, tightening of freedom of speech that has been going on in recent years, and that Russians have begun to actively protest in the last 15 months or so. But Putin is also returning to his pragmatic aloofness in measures religious. And we're unlikely, I think, to see any return to a model of a multi-confessional orthodox state in any formal sense where orthodoxy is placed at, 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 as, as first among unequals. Um, although there's still the challenge of finding a Russian and, uh, identity that transcends difference that remains. So I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Well, that was a fantastic survey. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. And, I'm uh, a historian, so I got, well, you have to know this. To <laughs> there is credit for this, for this course. Um, all right, there is a mic available to you here in the center, so, uh, so everybody can hear and so that it's videotaped for posterity. Please use the mic if you have any questions. Uh, don't all come at once. Yeah. <laughs> don't be shy. Sure. I wonder, Heather, if you could comment on the State Church of England, and is there some comparison between England and, and Russia, even over the last 500 years? Because those, those churches have had a relationship all that time, uh, and many of the attitudes, just from listening to you, seem familiar to me uh, from a study of England. And he wanted even more years. <laughs> Um, yes, I mean, <clears throat> that's, a, that's a, a good question and a, and a good point, that, that, um, that there's a, a, a broader pattern that emerged across Europe in the Reformation of, of confessional states, of states that had a, uh, had a state church and had a... Had a and, 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 then, and then we certainly see in the modern, in the modern era um, the, the process of the breaking down of those monopolies and, and the separation in Britain is one of the best examples in the 19th century of the gradual separation of what were called um, religious disabilities, which meant that if you, at the beginning of the 19th century, if you weren't an Anglican, you couldn't vote, you couldn't be part of, of politics. And uh, gradually over the 19th century, the Roman Catholics and, and dissenters, Methodists and so on, and, then, and Jews became part of the, the, the body politic. And so there was that. And so certainly these are wide, broad processes that happened elsewhere as well. And the, <clears throat> the remnants of, of that relationship between uh, churches and states and the remnants of religion as a way of organizing societies remains uh, much stronger in Western Europe than it does uh, in our North American context where we haven't experienced that to the same extent or at all depending on which side of the border you're on. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, uh, and so so certainly, Germany, for example, people tick off which religious taxes they're going to pay, and, and, the, and, and so there are multiple, essentially multiple established churches. And uh, in Britain, there, in Britain you, have, uh, you have a church that is established and that everybody technically belongs to a parish, but nobody attends. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, some people attend, but it's, it, they attend uh, because they want to, not because they have to, even if they're somehow connected to that geographic space. So you're, you're absolutely right. I think what's different is um, that, that uh, there has been a, uh, that, that religion is um, much less politicized and has, has been 
I mean, there are still the, there are there are great issues in multicultural Britain, of course, about about how to deal with this. But but uh, the church has pretty much, I think, given up on asserting that Englishness is Anglican, and it's a different. In in Russia, you have uh, a lot of people for whom uh, the for whom orthodoxy is, is a central feature of Russianness, even if you don't believe in God. And, 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 and that still has to be there. And so the, the, it's, it's part of this, this complicated process of reinventing uh, national identity after the Soviet period. I was a bit all over the place. Uh, you briefly mentioned um, Solzhenitsyn and mm -hmm. Tolstoy. <clears throat> I'm just curious what what role Russian authors such as them uh, played in maintaining the respectability and viability of religious faith during the communist era, and what stance the Orthodox Church took towards such authors during that time and now. During the Soviet period? Or, sorry, and, or, and currently, yeah. Um, well, um, the, the first thing to say is that, um, of course, much of the great Russian literature of the 19th century is, is preoccupied precisely with these, 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 these great questions of, 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 um, of faith. Uh, Dostoevsky is asking all the great questions that, of the 20th century, you know, do people want to be cared for or do they want to be free, and these, these great questions uh, that the Soviets then went and experimented with. Um, and so, um, and in fact, in the early Soviet period, the, uh, the, the authorities knew that, and they were quite worried about um, much of the great classics of Russian literature, and, and they were not taught in school, and they were discouraged, um, Dostoevsky and, and for, in, in particular, because of his uh, particular religious interests, but but a but a range of them. Um, uh, Tolstoy had an interesting uh, problematic relationship with the Orthodox Church. Uh, in fact, he was excommunicated in 1908. So, um, Tol Tolstoy uh, um, uh, is, his writing engages many of these critical issues, but in a much less orthodox kind of kind of formally orthodox kind of, kind of way. Um, so at any rate, uh, in fact, this is an interesting process that happened in the second half of the Soviet period, in, in the period after the Second World War. And especially in the 1960s and 70s, you have the rehabilit... During the Second World War, you had the rehabilitation of Russian history, basically. Stalin calls the population brother and sister and says, you know, we're all in this together, class war's over, we're, we're fighting for the Russian land. And, and that opens the door for a, a, the, re, the, re, the restoration of Russian culture in the, in the post-Soviet, in the post-war period. And so in the 1960s and 70s, uh, certainly Dostoevsky becomes widely read um, and available, you know, in bookstores and, and, and taught in schools and uh, revered and so on. And in fact, this becomes a kind of a, a way to faith for many people. And, and that reading becomes very critical to people's discovery of a whole set of ideas that, that uh, can contribute to, um, to um, sort of dissident thinking and sometimes action. Um, in the post-communist period, um, uh, literature lost the special role that it had in uh, Russian society uh, in the 19th and 20th centuries when uh, in the 19th and 20th centuries, people were never quite free, and literature was such an important way of talking about things that you couldn't talk about in other ways. And, and people were, were hungry, and they were busy, and there was much less reading. Uh, and also people could read more sort of schlock was suddenly available, <laughs> um, which also, you know, people like reading. Um, uh, the... Um, the church uh, certainly um, 
I think, continued to, to be very interested in promoting that tradition in Russian, in Russian literature. And literature was, was, um, was, was, is one of the great traditions of Russian seminary uh, or education is the literary the teaching of Russian literature. In the 19th century, oddly enough, the universities didn't, didn't think Russian literature was that important, but, the, but the, the church teaching institutions that were more sort of nativist thought religion, you know, that writing, Russian writing was important. And so there is a long tradition of the church supporting literature. Uh, I lived in Israel, Palestine for a long time, and I became aware of um, the Russian churches there. Mm -hmm. um, they were under the church in exile. Yes. We called the right Russian before 1948. Mm -hmm. 1948, the Soviet Union voted for the establishment of the State of Israel uh -huh. at the United Nations. Mm -hmm. So as a reward, uh, they got the properties mm -hmm. that were in Israel whereas those that stayed in Jordan remained white. Uh -huh. I was wondering well, what it. happened to the white Russians <laughs> after, because I felt uh, tremors in the white Russian community in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. but I don't know what happened to them mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. the fall of yeah. the Soviet Union. That's a very good question. Um, the, uh, yes, there was um, the, the, during the Soviet, already in the 1920s, the, the Soviet government tried to, to break the Orthodox Church from the inside to reduce its, its effectiveness. And uh, it, tried, it tried, for example, to promote a um, reformist group within the church uh, and, uh, called the Renovationists and allow them to form what was called the Living Church, which was a red church, a, a church that accepted Soviet power. And that failed in the early 1920s, but it created chaos, as you can imagine, in the congregations. And then um, by 1927, uh, the, they had put enough pressure on the, the head of the, uh, the, the metropolitan, the head of the church, uh, Serhi, that he, he sort of basically accepted Soviet power and, or its legitimacy. Um, and, uh, and this caused a, a break um, that had already been brewing during, in the, during the 20s, but the sort of final break. And, uh, and so you had uh, what was called the Ru Russian it's still called the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia, the Russian Orthodox Church abroad. And uh, we have a, there's a parish of the Russian Orthodox Church abroad here in, in, um, in Calgary. Uh, and it was a major denomination in, in uh, North America and Serbia and places where Russian uh, emigres went. And, and they have their own, yes. So they, 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 are, they separated completely, that's right. And, um, and uh, the, the, the Russian Orthodox Church abroad, uh, is, the raison d'etre was to oppose the devil in the Kremlin, as a guy who was a student my age said to me, <laughs> who had been raised in that church <laughs> when we were students in, in, in Moscow in the 1990s. Um, and uh, in fact, there was a very, very controversial uh, uh, reconciliation that happened about five years ago. Um, that was uh, that was that was driven, seen as being driven by Putin's government, that was trying to sort of um, gain gain friends for Russia abroad. Um, but, uh, and so there has been a, a, a very controversial rapprochement between the Russian Orthodox Church abroad and the, um, and the uh, synodal church in Moscow, the, 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 the Moscow church. And I'm just trying to remember the details of the, they're, they're still separate entities. They haven't completely recognized one another, but they haven't, um, I've forgotten the details, but, but it, it continues to be a subject of considerable tension. Yeah. 
and and the, the Holy Land is a good example. Yeah. yeah. The name Alexander Men comes yes. to my mind, but I can't remember <laughs> anything about him. Is he still of significance? Alexander Men is a fascinating uh, person. Um, Alexander Men was the was um, was a was a. a a, a wonderful example, actually, of precisely this, this uh, orthodox revival um, that happened in the 1960s and 70s uh, and that became an important basis for, uh, for a dissident alternative vision of, of uh, Russian uh, sort of identity. Uh, Alexander Mem uh, was, was in fact born uh, a Jew uh, was raised without religion as a young man and uh, came, uh, found God, um, I'm trying to remember the, the exact details, in the, in the 1950s and, uh, and became an Orthodox priest. And he, um, he established, uh, he, established uh, he, he had a parish in a small village that was outside of Moscow, but within daytime, you know, an easy day traveling distance. And he came, he, he came to be uh, sort of the great spiritual counselor of many members of the Russian intelligentsia in the, 19, in the 1970s. Um, they would travel out to this village to hear his sermons and to, to participate in the services in, the, in this village where men ministered and uh, the the police got very worried about him um, seeing seeing the emergence of sort of an alternative community around Mian in the countryside Mian never man man always said that he was not a dissident he always said i i am a priest and i serve my parishioners and i don't do politics and i'm not interested so he always asserted his non-dissident character but in fact he was uh, very much the spiritual advisor of of of, of uh, the sort of solzhenitsyn uh, uh, and other religious inspired dissidents and and he was killed um, in the mid 19 80s, just as things were changing, um, he got an axe in the back of the head that was widely viewed as having come from the KGB. And uh, Alexander Mien uh, has a huge following. Um, uh, that's a, com coming back to your question. In fact, Alexander Mien's books are, are widely available in stores, and he he wrote a lot. There was, of course, no Russian religious literature available, uh, so he wrote a lot of things to teach his his flock. And he wrote children's Bible books. He wrote, uh, you know, all kinds of, of things, and those have all those are all easily available in stores now. You see them everywhere. Um, so he's his his post. Uh, his post uh, posthumous uh, life as a pastor continues. Um, I've, I've heard, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I've heard two commentators or two uh, uh, lectures in the last six months have made the statement that for all practical purposes, the, the church in uh, Europe uh, is dead. Um, some commentators are saying it's one of the factors why Pope Benedict resigned. Not the only, but, but one of them. My question about Russia, mm -hmm. uh, is the church in Russia near dead? And if it is not, why is it not? Oh, boy. <laughs> I didn't I have to do a diagnosis. <laughs> um, well... Um, actually, that's an inter it's a very it's it's funny because um, another one of the themes that um, that the Russian Orthodox Church has used in its in its um, sort of campaigns uh, for for its position in in in, in post Soviet Russian society and especially in the last in the last five to ten years has been precisely to 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 share the language of Western European churches that talk about the church in crisis. That talk about the the this being sort of the final 
frontier of uh, that 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 secularism is winning in Europe and that the church is a is a victim. So, in fact, there's been a lot of uh, sort of exchange of that kind of language, parallel language with what is coming out of the Vatican and coming out of other other European churches. Um, Certainly, religious practice in Europe is extremely low across the continent compared to North America. Um, we're low compared to the United States, and the United States is, is, is actually a, an anomaly in modern societies. Um, even, in, even in Ireland and Poland, where um, uh, rates were very high until present, there's been a, quite a precipitous decline in the last decade. Um, uh, and so, so there, 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 are something t there is something behind these statements of anxiety. In Russia, um, I, I, I would say that um, the Russian church does not look doesn't look like what we're used to in North America, in the sense that um, this is a, a, this is a, imagine congregations that are entirely filled with unchurched people, with people who have no experience, no social habit of going to church on Sunday morning, who themselves were not raised by believers, so they don't have hymns that they can just sing at bedtime or, or you know, stories that they can tell easily to children. There's, there's, there's no, there's very little sort of um, memory, you know. Um, and so there's, 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 there's very little parish life. People, um, people under, under communism uh, were not used to social, independent kind of social organization, and they were used to waiting, well, they would be having to wait for something to be done, <laughs> uh, and expecting the government to be the place where something would be done from. And, and I think those habits um, meant that it was, that it was, there was, there wasn't a kind of a model of parish life there for people to replicate when communism disappeared. And so, uh, and so, and so, there's very little, to a great extent, there's very little of the kind of pattern that we're used to of, you know, uh, of, of fellowship and sort of regular getting together and that sort of thing. And, and yet, at the same time, there, 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 there is very active, um, you see people, orthodoxy, I, I'll just speak about orthodoxy at the moment, but orthodoxy has a great tradition of pilgrimage and, and traditions of, of going to monasteries. Uh, uh, visiting monasteries is an important part of, of, of religious practice, and people do flock to monasteries still. You see people, you know, going, and you see large numbers of people, and I, I, I have a feeling these people don't really belong to parishes, and yet they go. Um, so I think the church as an institution is, is uh, in a kind of a strange situation where there is genuine identification and interest, but not a kind of an understanding that if that there's, gonna, there's gotta be a collection plate that goes around and people have to put lots of money into it, not just a few kopecks, and that, you know, because it just won't happen unless we do it, you know? So I, that's sort of my answer. <laughs> Heather, I wanna pick up on the totalitarian cults that yeah. you referred to. Um, does that include Baptists? And so I, my question is, so how much freedom do groups like Baptists have, or totalitarian cults right now, <laughs> And how much freedom do Western groups have now, today, mm -hmm. to go into Russia if they're Baptists or yeah. under these cults? Yeah. Um, uh, by and large, Baptists are not considered a, a cult, um, a totalitarian cult, uh, because they have a long history in the Russian Empire. Um, and in fact, uh, in the early phases of the development of the 1997 law, 
um, the Baptists were in support of, of a law because they, they were worried too about all of these groups coming in who might steal their people and uh, they were also um, worried about um, you know, the Hare Krishnas and other such groups. Um, they were also, frankly, irritated by Western Baptists who came and told them how to be Baptists. <laughs> um, and, and, I, and I remember when I first went to, the, I went to the Baptist Federation of Russia to see if they had archives and discovered they were actually in a state museum. <laughs> but, um, but it was very interesting because the president of the Russian Federation of Baptists uh, you know, welcomed me and, and we, and I arrived just in time for the prayer meeting. So as we walked to the prayer meeting, that was not optional, I, uh, he said to me, we have a lot of foreigners who come here and they haven't been through what we've been through and they don't understand. That was my warning, you know. Um, but, um, so, so fundamentally, yes. But the thing is that uh, that language can be applied to anybody you feel like applying it to. And yes, it has been applied to to, um, to uh, new Baptist groups in new areas if that was convenient to some official somewhere, you know. Um, the, uh, the, certainly, you don't seem to see the same visibility that you did of uh, Scientologists. And uh, when I was doing my PhD research in 1995-96 when the place was falling apart and, you know, it was, I'm telling you, you know, the Harry Krishnas were out there on Nevsky Prospect every Saturday morning, and they had their restaurant, and the, 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 the Scientologists were in the metro every night when you were coming home, and uh, it, was, it was everywhere, and it's certainly not visible like that after 1997. Um, but again, there's, there's a kind of a local option aspect. Uh, please feel free to stay for coffee. Um, Heather is lecturing tomorrow noon. Uh, on campus. It'll be in Mac Hall, the Student Center, in the Bianca Room. So you're more than welcome to come to that lecture as well. So let's express our thanks to Heather Coleman. Thank you for your interesting questions. Thanks for coming.